Okay, welcome everybody. Why don't we get started? Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to, to welcome you today. Uh, today's talk is a little different than our regular talks uh, in, in that it's part of a, a whole themed week. Uh, across the country, uh, this is what's known as Banned Books Week, and the Center for Ethics, Law, and Society at Sonoma State is partnering with our library to do a whole thing about Banned Books Week. And one thing you can do, just uh, let me plug this event for you, uh, if you go over to the library on the second floor, this started yesterday, it's also happening today and tomorrow, um, the library is hiding six clues to books or CDs that have been banned at one point. Um, and if you find the clue, they're in red envelopes on the second floor. If you find the clue, um, you, can, you can redeem it for a free copy of that book or CD. And if you can solve the clue, you get a little bonus on top of that. Uh, and you can, you can redeem them uh, in the Center for Ethics, Law, and Society office, which is Nickel, uh, sorry, Carson 56, uh, today, uh, Wednesday at noon or Thursday at 3 o'clock. So just kind of look out for red envelopes in the library if you want free stuff. Um, okay, so as part of that and the emphasis on censorship, I wanted this week's talk to be on free speech. And thankfully, one of our distinguished alumni, Carl Olson, uh, who's on your right, um, is uh, a First Amendment expert with the law firm Kanata O'Toole Fickison Almazan. Uh, he specializes in defending the media, in particular in defamation cases, and he won the California Newspaper Publishers Association Freedom of Information Award in 2012, and he's been named a uh, title I really envy, Northern California Super Lawyer um, by San Francisco Magazine for, for 10 years. Um, and for his talk, free speech and fake news in the Trump era, Carl has partnered with another important member of the SSU community, Paul Gullickson. Paul is the uh, Press Democrats editorial director, which means that he oversees the editorial and um, op-ed pages. He's also received numerous awards from the California Newspaper Publishers Association and the San Francisco Peninsula Press Club, and is the past recipient of the New York Times Company's Chairman's Award for Editorial Writing. Uh, last but not least, Paul is also the uh, advisor for the STAR, the Sonoma State Campus Paper. And um, Carl was the founding editor of the Sonoma State Morning Glory, which was a student-run independent newspaper uh, back in the day. Um, so to help us learn more about free speech and fake news here during <coughs> Banned Books Week, please join me in welcoming Paul, uh, Paul Gullickson and Carl Olson. Thanks, Josh. Um, our original topic today uh, was going to be free speech in the Trump era, uh, something that uh, many of us feel is somewhat threatened. Uh, and then we decided to uh, amend the topic a little bit uh, to talk about fake news. Uh, Paul and I and uh, Professor David McEwen from Sonoma State and one of Paul's colleagues uh, at the Press Democrat were on a panel last week here, which was uh, very well attended and uh, uh, by both students and members of the community, including some elected officials. Uh, you can read about it in your Sonoma State Star today. Right, free flood. Um, so uh, the topic uh, last week was fake news, and I think uh, that's what we will talk about largely uh, today. So before uh, I turn it over to Paul for uh, a few minutes, uh, are, let's have a show of hands. Uh, does anyone, would anyone care to wade in and, and offer their definition uh, of fake news? Anybody uh, got any ideas? Um, okay, I didn't mean to put everybody on the spot right away. Uh, my wife, uh, in the car on the way up here today, uh, offered her definition, which I think is going to be pretty dated for most of you. She said, well, you know, it's what you see in the National Enquirer. Uh, and so, you know, the National Enquirer, may, maybe none of you have ever seen it or bought it. It's one of those magazines that you see at the supermarket. I think uh, it's still around. Check out, yeah. That's, that's the old term, fake news, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So, uh, Paul, uh, how would you define the term fake news? Well, um, I, I thank you all for having us today. And, um, you know, as Carl was saying, your kind of response was fairly common. You know, everybody knows the term, but they don't always necessarily know what it looks like, right? It's the old, like, the old definition of pornography. We, we know it when we see it. Um, but we all do o operate on different terms, and I think that um, for the sake of our discussion today, uh, I think we might set aside the president's definition, if you don't mind, um, because I'm not sure what that is, but it seems to be defined, uh, targeted at anything that he doesn't like or something that casts him in a poor light, right? I mean, you talk about this being banned books week. I think if we were the president, he'd ban newspapers as well. Um, that, that's uh, sort of because he just he calls all newspapers enemy of the enemy of the the people. And if you can see this political cartoon, that sort of reflects um, what many people in the newspaper business are feeling this uh, today. Because uh, you know, most of the reporting that's going on out there really has to do with day-to-day uh, uh, -day stuff, um, telling people what's really going on. And, and uh, you know, for example, here, the person at the top writes about City Hall, discovers misuse of funds, writes about the weather, uh, warns you about tornadoes, writes about toxic spill. And then the last panel shows uh, enemy of the people, yeah, right, W-R-I-T-E. That's sort of kind of how a lot of people are, are feeling the president sort of talking about media as enemy of the people is, it's like, well, what, what is fake news? So what, what is it? How do we describe it? Well, the Sonoma State Star, we actually, I put this to our staff a year ago, and they came up with their own definition, which I thought was pretty, pretty good. Um, and it's a news report published or released with knowledge of its falsehood or willful disregard for its accuracy and with the intent to deceive the public. And I like that uh, mainly for, because the two really important components here, the willful disregard for its accuracy and with the intent to deceive. And so that separates it from those who might use call fake news anything they don't like. I also would sort of dis disregard, uh, set aside the those who say fake news anytime somebody writes a story and it's inaccurate, right? And, and, and if, it's, if there's a, a real, real uh, intent not to... To, to get the truth out there, uh, 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 a, 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 a newspaper will do what after they've made a mistake? What will they no traditionally do? What will you see in a newspaper? A retraction. A retraction. What else? What else? They'll edit it and like update it. Well, yeah. In, in an era now online, they can actually real time it, go in, change it so that the next person who sees it online. Yeah. What else might you see under a tra traditional thing? That you see a newspaper do if they've made a mistake. Somebody else, yes. The apology. The apology to run a correction, and as opposed to retraction, the retraction is what the Rolling Stone did last last year with the 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 rape case. The, the, there was a, a report of the rape case, and they realized they just completely the person who was the source of that was a complete fabrication, and they retracted that story. They wholly said the whole thing was inaccurate and made up. Correction is basically saying, hey, look, most of our story is correct, but we made a mistake in a, certain, in a certain component. Well, this definition sort of really gets to the part of fake news, which is news that goes out there and really wants to deceive the public, that the, that the author of it either knew it was false or just had deep suspicions about its accuracy. And, and we'll get to some examples of that. And the other one is the intent to deceive. That, that, and, and that really covers a lot of, of news that you see out there. And here's some quick examples. If you don't mind, Carl, if I go through some of these. Um, so some of the fake news that we've seen, just to break them down to category, we see a lot in social media, right? Raise your hand if you see if you come across fake news on on social media. Like, right, yeah, every, we all have, right? And raise your new raise your hand if you afforded fake news, not knowing, not knowing that it was fake, but discovered later it was fake. Yeah, I I've, I've been caught. How, how many have how many has forwarded news? Knowing it was fake. Who wants to admit that? Yeah, okay, that's honest, that's honest. Uh, there was a recent poll that found 16% of people acknowledged they, they forwarded stuff that they knew was fake. Um, but uh, uh, so that's, what, that's a source of where we see a lot of fake news. The other one are these pseudo websites, su su uh, sites out there like uh, InfoWars that really are trying to provoke an ideology or an emotion. They're really not, their job is really not to get information out there, present a balanced um, 
uh, perspective on a story. Their their job is to just get emotion and get and get viewers, right? Because when you got viewers on the internet, you get money. So that's the big uh, uh, driving component there. And the and the last one is intervention by entities abroad, and namely Russia. And we've seen has anybody has anybody seen some stories this last week about Facebook? In the last couple of weeks, what what have you heard? Yeah, that that prior to the election last year, that they were act there were Russian uh, groups that were actually uh, putting in fake ads, buying fake ads on Facebook, which were then <coughs> distributed to millions of people, uh, mostly um, anti-Hillary Clinton um, messages or just issues that are trying to drive wedge between groups and 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 foment dissent and polarization, which we got plenty of. Um, and then there's also examples of just completely fabricated Facebook pages that were created, and they were driven by Russian groups, trying to then were then 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 used to promote, hey everybody, go to this website DC Links, which was created by a branch of the Russian military, to promote information that had been hacked from from democratic um, emails, and that was also prior to the election, and so. Facebook for a long time had said, hey, our hands are clean on this. We didn't have any real bearing on the outcome of the election last year. Well, now Mark Zuckerberg is changing his tone a little bit and saying, yeah, maybe we did have a role. And, and they're turning over information to some congressional investigations. They're turning over the ads you talked about. They're turning over some of the fake, ba fake pages. So these are sort of the three areas we're really seeing fake news um, uh, really expand and broaden. And, 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 and some of these, these are just some examples. You guys have all seen some of these hurricane photos. This is an example of National Weather Service put out a, uh, an alert saying there's a completely false story out about Hurricane Irma, which was prior to Maria, that it was a category six. There is no category six, right? Hot five as high as they go. And it was heading straight for Houston, which is already hammered by Harvey and half the people in Houston were still canoeing out of their driveways and scaring, and this scared the heck out of a lot of people. The National Weather Service did something I haven't seen them do. Actually sent out an alert telling people, hey, it's a fake news story, don't believe it. It was causing a lot of panic. And then you had a lot of fake story. This is a photo supposedly of the Houston airport underwater. Up to, anybody see that? Anybody see that? I, I, I fell for it. I, I fell for it. Um, Here's one of my favorite. My wife and I were watching this video. Supposedly, they have these red crabs on one of the uh, keys down in Florida. How they were um, scampering across the the road after Hurricane Irma. Well, it turned to be out to be totally fabricated. These are actually these are actually crabs from Christmas Island who on their annual migration to, uh, to <laughs> Indian Ocean. It was like four years ago. And my wife and I are sitting there. Oh, isn't nature really fascinating? And and I I completely fell for it. I'm I'm. And so these are sort of the, but these are sort of the minor ones. Some of the more significant ones are somebody actually took a picture of, this was one of the protests in Oakland um, after the Ferguson shootings, I believe. And they posted, it said, Black Lives Matter thugs blocking emergency crews from reaching hurricane victims. It was a completely bogus story, and yet people started circulating because it would affirm what they wanted to believe, that people were actually out there doing that kind of stupid stuff. But it was a it was a it was a fabricated uh, story, and so, so so these things are very uh, prevalent. On and then of course some of the ones we've 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 certainly heard of, of that Hillary Clinton sold weapons to ISIS. This was very popular just before the election, and then the the most famous one was the Pope uh, endorses Trump, which was a complete fabrication. I have a brother-in-law who still believes that. I can't convince him otherwise. Um, no amount, and and this originated from some website that looked like a TV station out of Chicago, but nobody was really quite clear uh, who was behind this. But it, it this one had more than a million um, shares on Facebook alone uh, prior to November 8th, the election day. So, how, and and these things don't remember. You know, Michigan uh, went to Trump only by 10,000 votes. Um, what Wisconsin was forty thousand. It doesn't. It, uh, the total number of votes that m might have swayed this outcome of this election was about seventy thousand, which is, you know, half the population of Santa Rosa. 
it really didn't take a lot to turn the electoral college outcome. And so, you know, some, you, you, you don't really know how much this might have ch swayed people in their decisions on who they were going to vote for. Um, so anyway, that's sort of a, a definition of fake news. Do you want to, um, and, and, and but, but one of the problems about this is how do you regulate this? How do you, how do you control this, right? And there were some legislators, there was, there's a lot of frustration right now. We're still trying to get un, understand what happened in 2016. But the, the question is how do you control this, given that our protections for free speech, given our First Amendment, um, how do you, uh, how do you uh, control this? And we had some legislators in California who actually uh, uh, submitted a bill that to basically ban fake news. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, there was a bill last year uh, introduced that would have made it illegal to uh, publish misleading, false or misleading statements with uh, the intent to influence an election. Uh, in other words, pretty much everything <laughs> said in the course of the campaign. And uh, there were immediate protests about that legislation. It was withdrawn, and uh, a much narrower version of it was passed that basically forbids cyber squatting, which is basically taking, any, taking over anyone else's website. So if you go on, you know, DonaldTrump.com, you get a message for Hillary or one of his opponents or vice versa. So that uh, has been forbidden before for uh, electoral propositions and, and now it was passed that it would apply to candidates. Um, a little bit of historical perspective. Um, the problem of fake news is not entirely new, uh, none other than Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, <laughs> said, quote, nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being into that, put into that polluted vehicle. So uh, it, it's not entirely new for politicians to attack uh, the media. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the Ken Burns documentary about Vietnam, which has been showing, but uh, uh, certainly President Nixon uh, attacked the media very vociferously. Um, but the problem is different now because the news is not as curated as it used to be. The uh, distinguished journalist Walter Lippmann said many years ago, the news of the day as it reaches the newspaper office is an incredible medley of fact, propaganda, rumor, suspicion, clues, hopes, and fears. And the task of selecting and ordering that news is one of the truly sacred and priestly offices in a democracy. The problem is right now that you don't have the curators. You do to some extent. Obviously, newspapers uh, are still with us. Television is still with us. But uh, you know, people don't get their news from those vehicles to the same extent. So instead of having professional editors who, who fact check, uh, who, who check things out, instead of having professional reporters who get both sides, uh, a lot of us get our news from, uh, you know, uh, sort of one-view uh, vehicles that that aren't checked out. They're they're only there uh, to purvey one one point of view, and um, so y you don't have the same degree of reporting. You don't have editing, and so it's easier to spread fake news. Uh, another thing that's interesting from a legal point of view, uh, Paul gave the uh, definition that the Sonoma State Star came up with of fake news, and that's not all that different than how the U.S. Supreme Court has defined the term actual malice, which determines when somebody can recover in a defamation lawsuit 
uh, that's brought against somebody. So public figures, uh, it's very hard for them to win a lawsuit if somebody publishes something that's false and damaging about them, but you can recover damages. Uh, a, a public figure can recover damages if a statement is made with knowledge of its falsity or with reckless disregard of whether it's true or false. So that's kind of similar to the definition of fake news. But that is a really, really, really high bar for somebody to meet. And so public figures hardly ever uh, prevail in, in a lawsuit against uh, a media entity that uh, has published something about them. They just, basically, they have to grin and bear it. Um, and most of them uh, don't even try to file a lawsuit, especially, uh, especially you know, for something that's published in an election. Although I think you're seeing more uh, use of the libel laws in the Trump era because I think he has kind of encouraged people to go after the media and, in my view, to try and intimidate uh, the media. So you're seeing a lot more of that happening. Uh, I'm representing a nonprofit environmental group right now that's being sued by a big timber company in Canada uh, and for you know basically publishing critical commentary about this timber company's attempts to you know to cut trees in the boreal forest. Yeah, just to uh, uh, riff off of what he's saying, you know we. We set a high bar for this free speech, and, and under that bar, we say, yeah, we're going to allow fake news. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think we set that bar so high in our, um, in our laws and in our Constitution? What do you think? What, why is it hard? Why is it? Uh, why is it that Carl and I are actually on? A, uh, I should also acknowledge we're on a group. We're on the board of a group called the First Amendment Coalition, and we uh, weigh in on legislation, sometimes on litigation, sometimes we sick Carl on on groups that are um, uh, doing bad things. Carl's a great, a really respected uh, First Amendment attorney, and he's won some major cases in the state, and. Uh, but the question is, why would our group be opposed to a law that says we should just ban fake news and political speech? Why, is, why would that be a problem? <clears throat> Who wants to take a stab? What do you think? Because of the First Amendment? Yeah, why would that be? Because it's freedom of speech. Yeah, so, so we all recognize these are problems, and they actually might be even damaging to somebody. But a lot, there's a lot of speech that gets said in political campaigns that are maybe a little rhetorical, a lot of embellishment. Um, and, I, and I encounter this all the time. And when, when I, we pick letters to the editor, what letters to the editor publish in the newspaper, right? And people often say, why did you run that letter? In fact, I've got a run, letter running tomorrow. It says, shame on you for running that letter that was critical of Hillary Clinton. And the, the contention is that um, it was factually inaccurate. Well, the reality is that we don't run letters that we know to be inaccurate. But we do allow a broad license, much like our free speech laws, for, for, for speech that is critical. And, uh, and this particular uh, letter said some un unkind things about uh, Hillary Clinton, um, but not necessarily things that were factually untrue. For example, if somebody writes a letter and says, uh, Professor Paul Gullickson, instructor, or editorial director Paul Gullickson, um, is uh, is a, 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 a convicted drunk driver. Is that an opinion or is that a fact? Huh? It'd be, it'd be a fact. Well, it would be factual. You could, you could actually check it, right? So you'd have to be able to su support that. And if that turns out to be not true, I might hire Carl to go defend me in a libel case. But if somebody writes this as uh, editorial director Paul Gullickson is a clown, is that opinion or is that fact? Opinion. It's opinion. I mean, I might interpret that as, a, hey, I don't work for a circus. You have to prove that. But a mo most reasonable people will say, no, that's just rhetorical embellishment, and, and that's and that's why you know, and that's and that's why we don't have laws that ban people from saying Paul Gullickson is a clown because it's part of the 
we want to have robust debate that goes on out there. And as, as Carl noted, this goes back to the days of Thomas Jefferson. I mean, our papers back there were pretty, they were pretty incendiary. And, and our libel laws weren't quite developed yet at the time. But, but we, we have a certain standard for opinion. It, it's called a fair comment and criticism. It actually rises above the standard we have for uh, factual statements. And as long as a reasonable person can interpret what's being said as opinion, Therefore, it be, can be covered. And a lot of fake news is sort of thrown out there as opinion. And I'll make one more point, and I'll go back to what, what Carl was saying. Um, one of the problems nowadays is when you're watching like network news like CNN or Fox, can you tell when they're talking about factual statements and when they start talking about opinion? Can you tell? I can't. It usually, the old days, they would have a news hour, right? And they would talk, they'd have somebody just giving news reports for 30 seconds or two minute segments, and then they'd move on to one story after the other. Nowadays on CNN, you have somebody who comes on, gives you a breaking update. This just in, so-and-so is going to be subpoenaed for the uh, Mueller investigation, blah, blah, blah. And then for the next 25 minutes, you get a panel of experts debating whether it's a good thing, bad thing, whatever. And, they, and sometimes they start yelling at each other. That's clearly opinion, but I'm not sure the average reader or, or, or viewer can understand when that transition is made from fact to opinion. Now, in newspapers, we have very clear news section here, opinion section here. I don't sit in on news meetings, and news meetings don't sit on opinion meetings. Do you think it should be like um, the responsibility of news organizations to decipher, like make it very clear for that reason? We're talking news right now as opposed to open debate. I, if I had a magic wand, I would, I, would wave, I would wave that, and that's the way I would like to do it. Okay. I'm a traditionalist. I, I feel like it should be really clear to people what is opinion and what's news, what's, what's fact-based right. news. I'm not sure that's always there. I don't think it is either. I think oftentimes they, like, spit. I think the problem is that people associate their opinion because it seems reasonable to them with truth and then say that two or more truths cannot exist at the same time right. when really a lot of truths exist at the same time and so there, there's like a, a conflict there about whose truth is going to sway like opinion right. in the public. And it becomes a sharing of truthiness as opposed to actual sharing of facts. Yeah. Um, I just read a story about this, this small town in, in Idaho, Twin Falls, Idaho where there was a, an attack, a, a sexual assault that occurred between a, a seven-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl. And, I, and that's, they're still not saying what actually occurred, but it was something of a sexual net nature. And then there was a 10-year-old boy who tried to film it on a cell phone but didn't know what he was doing. And some parents encountered this, and, um, and they stopped it, became, but it became a criminal matter. And it, and it turned out the seven-year-old boy and the ten-year-old boy were, were, one was Iraqi and one was Afghani, and the girl was uh, a, a native of, of Idaho, a white girl. And all of a sudden, it started spreading on the rumor on the internet that these Muslim-born men had attacked an American woman and raped her, and that nobody was being held accountable for it. And it completely, and Breitbart News had a reporter out there, if you don't know Breitbart News, they're one of these alt-right organizations. They had a reporter out based in Twin Falls for two and a half months doing nothing but reporting on this story. It was an absolutely fake news story. It was, it, it had, it, it was there was nothing there, but they were saying it's, it was, they were reporting all this information about it, and, and it became a, its, its own thing. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy and nobody could dial it back to the, what the truth is. And Mark Twain once said, you know, um, the, uh, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth ever gets its boots on. And, and I believe that was before the internet. Um, and you think about it now, it's like you, it's once, once a falsity gets out there because of the sharing opinion and all of a sudden people start morphing something into something that's real, it's really hard to dial it back. It's like, you know, pump and, uh, Pope endorses Trump. And, and, and so it, it ultimately it comes down to all of us being really more discerning on what it is that we, that we read and, most importantly, what we share. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I think that even the uh, so-called mainstream media, I, I think there uh, is kind of more shading right now between uh, news and editorials, you know, like 
I'm somewhat old school, so I get my news largely from the New York Times, but I think you see more sort of news analysis on the front page than right. than you used to. But it's still labeled. It's they'll, still, they'll still labeled. Say, or they may say analysis. analysis or commentary. Right. It's very strictly labeled. And and I wonder whether everybody gets that. I mean, I I used to be a journalist. I'm a media lawyer now, so I kind of get the distinction. But I'm not sure that everyone uh, gets that. And another thing that uh, has been kind of interesting in the last few days is. There's been this documentary uh, by Ken Burns about Vietnam, and he's had some clips from Walter Cronkite, the late great CBS News anchorman, uh, back in the day when basically everybody got their news from uh, from television uh, or from newspapers, and they've had a couple clips where Cronkite was offering his opinion. And I've looked at those and, and said to myself, that was really unusual. That was cutting edge. That, that was yeah. ex exceptional because yeah. he would hardly ever do that. And, and he only did that when things were just sort of spinning out of control uh, in Vietnam. And, and we were getting fake news, I think, from our government. Uh, there's an old saying that truth is the first casualty of war. And so I think our government was intentionally trying to mislead people about what was really happening uh, on the ground over there. Yeah. And, 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 and because in war, people are inclined to want to believe a certain thing. They want to support a war. They want, so they're, they're less inclined to believe um, an alternate, you know, a, a reality that differs from what they, the truth that they want to um, they want to believe, or the, or the government is telling them. And that's also why we're also very vulnerable right now uh, to the manip manipulations by outside governments. Do you mind if I show a couple of slides from... Um, oh, this is, uh, as Carl was saying, about how fake news has been around for a long time. This was actually published... Wasn't this... Did David say this was published in the New York Times? It was actually a, 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 a rendition of what somebody uh, on authority said, this is what life looks like on the moon. Um, this was a, this was a scientific, uh, verified account of what life on the moon uh, looks like, and of course this was before the in the 1800s. But um, but you know fake news has been around for a long time. Um, oh, and this is this the story of Pizzagate. Does anybody know the story of Pizzagate? This is this is one of the, the this is an example of how fake news can have real impacts in people's lives. There was somebody who made up a story that. Hillary Clinton was running a child sex trafficking operation out of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. Oh, I saw that, yeah. Okay, and what happened? I don't remember <laughs> how it wrapped up. Anybody remember? Well, this was uh, circulating and it became its own thing again where people started sharing, well, so and so, so and so, and then all of a sudden people were sharing opinions. You're not sure what's fact or what's real, and it was made up out of whole cloth, and yet it became, it became, it attracted, uh, hundreds of thousands of shares and likes and blogs and all over the internet. Finally, this guy down in um, uh, North Carolina got tired of the fact that nobody was doing anything to help these poor kids who were running, they were being held captive in this pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. So he gets his AK-47, throws it in his truck, drives all the way to Washington, D.C., kicks in the door of the pizza parlor and starts shooting the place up because he's had it. He's had it with this conspiracy. Well, lo and behold, he found out all they had there was pizza and beer, and um, and now his life is ruined because um, you know he's being held on felony criminal charges, um, use of a firearm, a whole bunch of long list of things, but he actually believed it. He actually believed this 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 crap that was going on out there, and um, and now you know his life is ruined. And of course, thankfully, nobody was hurt inside the pizza parlor, but but. The story still circulates. People still believe it's true. Um, here I'll go on, and this is this shows an, a, one analysis that uh, that BuzzFeed did that showed that basically in the days leading up to the election, there were more of the stories that were shared on social media were fake news than were real news. Let me repeat that: that the weeks leading up to the election, more of the news that was shared, liked. Uh, uh, commented on on Facebook 
were, were fake news than, than the real news. Why do you think people are more inclined to believe fake news than real news? What do you think? Emotional. What do you think? Because it feeds into what they believe. It, feed, it often feeds into what you believe. You know, you people people dislike Hillary Clinton so much they would actually believe that. Yeah, I could see her running a sex operation involving children. What else? Why else? What do you think? It's just interesting. It's interesting, right? They say truth is is stranger than fiction. Not not always. There is some really interesting fiction that goes on out there, and that people start clicking on. They share. And, 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 and people will share stuff, and their, their comment will be, I don't know if this is true, but what if it is? This is really interesting. I mean, they're, they're, we have hesi we're hesitant, but you know, we're all moving fast. We, we look at stuff really, really quickly. And yeah, sometimes it's really easier to believe. And there's a shock value involved, right? It's grabbing. It's interesting. And um, you know, when we're so wrapped up in things on, online, whether it's video games, movies, whatever, Sometimes, you know, all that stuff is more interesting than real life. And sometimes we, we want to believe that's true. Um, these are some of the stories, you know, Pope endorses Trump, number one. Um, this is an example of one of the absolute fake uh, Facebook pages. Looks really cute. You got a little daughter with butterfly paint, right? Melvin Rednick doesn't exist. He was created by a Russian company. There's more than uh, 500 of these that the uh, Facebook took down. Um, and he was pushing, pushing uh, links to uh, websites, um, which uh, also offered you know fake news. But this is part of the reason why Facebook's been in the news so much. And um, does anybody want to know? Does anybody take a guess how many Facebook pages Facebook takes down every day? Anybody want to guess? You know how many? What do you think? Hundred thousand. One million. Every day, one million pages. Now, not all of them are phony and created by Russians taken, but a lot of them are dead sites. Um, Russia, these are the fake ones of Russia. What they don't know is how many that these Russian groups actually co-opted uh, stagnant sites that somebody didn't, hadn't been using for a while and then started using their, their friends to push more new information. But this is such a big problem. Um, and it's one of the problems why Facebook says we can't necessarily control it. All we do is we create the information highways for everybody to drive on. We can't control what everybody does behind the wheel on those highways. And that's why you know, Zuckerberg's under a lot of pressure nowadays. Um, uh, I just wanted to cut to, um, these are some of the examples of what they are doing. If you look down here, does this thing have a pointer on it? Yeah, the green If you look down right here, uh, they've now started putting little flags on, on um, things that are shared on Facebook. If there's a question about it, this one says disputed by Associated Press and Snopes.com. You can see that one. Um, uh, this is uh, Bing and Google are doing the same thing. There was a story out, this is really offensive, that Reese's peanut butter cups to be discontinued. I, that <laughs> caused quite an uproar in my family. Uh, fortunately, I was able to say that they have a little tag here. It says fact checked by Snopes.com, mostly false. Um, both Bing and, and Google have been on that. So they're, they're, they're trying to do that. Um, and Snopes.com, is, is, I think, is has anybody been on Snopes.com? Have you been there? You use it? Yes. Yeah. Every time your mom says, hey, have you read about this? You know, you should never knock twice on a door and then look in your rear view mirror and beep, you know, this will this will be an alert to an attacker. I mean, there's all kinds of garbage out there. I, I encourage you to go to Snopes.com. It's a great clearinghouse for, for true facts. Um, here's, a, here's another one. Factcheck.org is great for political information. Um, and and uh, th this one I really like because this one, if you're looking for the right information, um, about healthcare, science, you know, climate change. I mean, granted, they have certain uh, political perspectives on things, but they're they're going to be verifiable facts that you can then take, and if somebody's, um, you can challenge somebody on their on their news. And this is one of my favorites, Politifact. This one, they actually take uh, comments that people make in the news media that may, uh, may be true, may not. Bloggers, sometimes things that are shared on the internet. 
and they have a little they have a little um, truthometer they call it, and they'll say it's either true, mostly true, somewhat false, false, and my favorite is pants on fire false. Uh, we get little flames going here, and uh, and then you can actually uh, check on it, and they'll explain why it's uh, mostly fake or whatever. Those are some guidelines. So there are tools that are uh, developing out there to help identify uh, fake news. But because of our you know, freedoms of speech, we don't want to create an environment where we start telling people, you know, no, you can't say that, you can't say that. We don't want to be policing it that much. We're going to, the, the burden is on us as consumers, as readers, to be discerning about what it is we, we read and what we share and what we believe. Ultimately. Yeah, the U.S. Supreme Court in the famous case of New York Times versus Sullivan, which protected uh, speakers from being sued by public figures, had a great line, which uh, is one of my favorites, that says that uninhibited, robust, and wide open debate is essential to a democracy. Uh, and the California Supreme Court, in the case that um, I had the privilege of litigating, said that openness in government is essential to the functioning of a democracy. So, uh, as Paul said, it really is up to us uh, to be alert consumers of the news. Uh, government shouldn't be regulating uh, what we are hearing. You don't want politicians uh, telling you what the news is. I mean, that's what, that's what uh, leaders of totalitarian governments do. Uh, and it's antithetical uh, to our country and to the freedom of speech uh, upon which our government was founded. We were talking about Thomas Jefferson earlier, and uh, he's the one that did away with the so-called Sedition Act. And, uh, and, and that was very instrumental in giving us the freedoms that we still have. And well, I read to you uh, uh, something earlier in which he was pretty critical of newspapers. Uh, he also said that if I had to choose between government without newspapers or newspapers without government, I should not hesitate uh, to choose the latter. So uh, I, I think... It's one of my favorite quotes. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I think mature <coughs> leaders recognize the importance of a free press. Uh, unfortunately, we have some pretty immature leaders uh, right now, but uh, you know it's not the first time. Uh, you know, and uh, as an editorial writer, I mean, I'll be honest, we, we write, we have written many critical things over presidents before, and we probably have written more about this one than we have previous ones. But the reality is, we do, we don't take that for granted. In in many other countries around the world, we would have been hung for the things that we've written. Um, We've said about our leader, um, and we live in a we live in a, in a an environment in which we we protect that and we we cherish that, and that's why Carl and I push back um, against groups that try to control that speech, believing that there's a simple answer to all these things. There, there's not. We, we're going to have to adapt to it. So, is, are there any questions? We only have about five minutes left. Yeah. How do you feel about BuzzFeed news? Considering you use one of their graphs, and they are one of the leading news sites that people aging from like 13 all the way up to 25 use a lot, since they do have an app and whatnot. Um, I I actually like BuzzFeed because I, I love it when they actually go to some of these um, rallies and interview people because I feel like they're very illuminating and helping you understand how people think, particularly at some of these Trump rallies, I find it really interesting. Now granted, they're gonna, have, they're gonna have a bias. They're, in, they're, they're kind of, sometimes uh, a newspaper can demonstrate its bias not by what it covers or what it says, but what it doesn't cover. And Buzz, Buzz uh, it, is very focused on certain things, you know, and they have a certain perspective, and I think that's reflective of that. But I think what they do, I think is, is fair for the most part. And, and I think they reflect a new era in journalism where you have a lot of live coverage, live interaction. Um, but again, that's the same thing where there's, there's a lot of opinion that's being shared that's not always, that's not always um, fact-based. But I, so I, I do think people, people, I don't think anymore you can rely on one source of news. I think you need to get a, a, a steady diet of a variety of sources. And, and, uh, but you have to develop a, 
all sources, I've always said news, news organizations depend on two things, rev revenue and credibility. If you don't have both, you, you're not going to exist very long. And um, I think there's a lot of organizations out there that are showing that they don't have to have credibility. And, I'm, and like InfoWars, I think, is, is a very specious organization. They throw out all kinds of stuff. But as long as it draws readers, what do they care? And it becomes almost fiction of itself. So. Yeah, I, I think it's important to have many voices. Uh, you know, I was talking earlier about the proliferation of libel suits, and there was one against Gawker. And you know, I frankly I've never really read Gawker, but you know, they were basically put out of business by a large libel judgment. And I think you really have to guard against that. And the the best remedy for false speech is, is counter speech. It's for somebody else to come out with what the real truth is. Any other uh, questions? Well, um, again, I, I think it's important for us to, to be discerning consumers of news and to respect other points of view. And, and, and recognize that uh, divergent views are what makes this country great and uh, why we're lucky that we don't live in places that, that, that don't allow uh, different points of view. Uh, you know, I, Paul wanted me to talk about the Berkeley thing. And, you know, I think it's important and you can't have content-based discrimination, especially in a public university. So whatever you think of Milo Yiannopoulos, the guy who cost the taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars by giving a stupid 15-minute speech, I think, you know, I think UC made the right call when they recognized that, you know, they had to allow different points of view uh, in Sproul Plaza where Mario Savio started the free speech movement. So we, we obviously believe, you know, allowing free speech, but the best, the best an, an answer is robust debate. You know, or or I, I would say in Milo's case, you know, rather than focusing on him, you know, go over and have a better debate over there. But, um, uh, you know, that there's nothing to fear necessarily um, from, from speech in and of itself. Here's a couple of other just tips we had on... on uh, you know how to how to know whether to trust the story, and my, my my favorite tip is actually check check the URL. If it ends in com.co or com.lo, um, it's probably a fake news site, and I, I swear that would probably eliminate a lot of the the junk that's out there if we just got that word out. But um, we ran an editorial yesterday where we we. Um, uh, we we gave guidelines on how to spot fake news, but um, my uh, favorite is that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably, it probably is. is. Yeah, if it sounds that's too bad to be true. <laughs> it probably yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, you are going to have mistakes. The famous Dewey beats Truman headline in the Chicago Tribune. They got it wrong. Uh, uh, Truman won, but uh, so. Error is inevitable in free debate, but uh, you shouldn't censor it. And, because uh, of that. And, and you just got to be careful and try to get as many points as you can. Yeah. Thank you guys very hey, much. Hey, thank you all. Yeah.